Greetings to our listeners, and this is our lesson of study, lesson number 10 for May the 3rd, 2020. Still out of our spring quarterly study, this is Unit 3, Called to God's Work of Justice. And our title for our lesson for this Sunday is The Return of Joy. And our prayer is is that we hope that this lesson finds all of our listeners who have tuned in in the peace and safety of Almighty God. And uh, we hope that as we indulge ourselves into our lesson, that the things that God would have us to understand and then apply to our daily lives would be received. Again, our title for our lesson for this Sunday out of our Faith Pathway study manual is The Return of Joy. And our devotional reading is Psalm number 47. Our background scripture is Zephaniah, the third chapter, and our printed passage is Zephaniah, the third chapter, verses 14 through 20. Our key verse is Zephaniah 3, verse 19, and I am reading from the NIV, and it reads, At that time I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. And our lesson's aims are to discern the need for the just restoration of God's people, aspire to trust God for victory, hope, and renewal, celebrate the return of God, let me repeat that or restate that, celebrate the return of joy and God's glory in salvation. And our lesson has three different sections to it. And our first section is jubilation for future deliverance. Jubilation for future deliverance. The second is the promise of God's presence. And then our third section is a promised transformation. So our lesson has quite a few points of reference which we uh, could, time permitting, indulge into a lengthy discussion. But... Uh, to expedite and use our time efficiently, we will highlight uh, some of the insights and uh, try and summarize to some length the significance of what our lesson has pointed out. One of uh, the things that I thought was of significance Uh, to bring attention to was the beginning of our lesson, uh, the introduction. And it made a point uh, to kind of distinguish between happiness and joy. And it spoke about that from a secular point of view, that the emotional state can be attributed to failure to obtain and keep things and specific people in their lives. 
So it's speaking of a certain acquisition of things and saying how that the acquisition of these things can be attributed to a emotional state uh, linked to either our ability to obtain certain things and keep them or our inability to obtain certain things and keep them for different people in our lives. But then it speaks to also that in the process of acquiring these things that the practice of it becomes overwhelming. And it, it states it in this light. It says, the more some people acquire, the unhappier they become because the desire to get more takes over their lives. The root of this emotional challenge lies in not understanding the difference between happiness and joy. And when we look at this uh, in, uh, I guess, another perspective uh, relative to just the definition and uh, meaning of the two words, one factor that distinguishes between happiness and joy, happiness is stated as a emotion. And it is external. Joy is not stated as an emotion, but it is r rather a state of mind and an orientation or a positioning of the heart. So joy is internal, while happiness is external. Happiness can be provoked or incited by tangible things, whereas joy is not provoked or incited by external things, but internal. And in our spiritual walk, we refer to it many times in this light, and we always say, this joy that I have, the world did not give it to me. And simply because the world did not give it to me, then the world cannot take it away from me. The joy is spiritually bound. It is uh, spiritually awarded. It's something that God grants to us internally. And so it's not, it's not promoted by things that are external. Uh, I believe it is the Declaration of Independence of uh, America, which coined these words, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It didn't say that... Uh, you would get it. It said it would provide life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so, uh, one of those, this was just one of the things that was lifted in our uh, study, in our lesson, in the introduction. And another focus here was about uh, Jerusalem and Zion, and a lot of times Jerusalem and Zion are somewhat uh, used in exchange of each other. Um, uh, still speaking of the dwelling place of the presence of God, and sometimes referred to as the city in the city of David. Uh, but uh, our lesson talks about how the people were very much infused or uh, in excited um, because of the assembly, because of the dwelling place. 
in Jerusalem where they assembled themselves and gathered themselves because there they felt the presence of God. And we currently are in a situation um, for most of uh, the people experiencing this. This is a first time uh, occurrence of where we are not collectively are uh, together assembled in our places of worship. And uh, for many, uh, this is a new experience, a new on-taking of our relationship and our uh, uh our collective gathering as a group of people and now individually being experienced and practiced uh, away from each other as a group. But now our focus is not just upon the collective gathering or assembly of us in our individual places of worship where we gather together to experience collectively the presence of God. But now we are individually still experiencing our relationship with God, but away from each other as a group. And so when we look at the focus and the joy uh, which is assessed to our lesson because of their being able uh, to gather together and assemble again in the place that represents the glory of God, we now recognize that there are also times uh, which had been experienced in by the people in our lesson, but there are times where we must reflect upon our personal relationship with God and then also expound upon the reward of that. And then once again, as it is stated in our lesson, once Jerusalem or Zion were then able to gather collectively as Zephaniah was explaining to them that the day was coming where they were going to be able to assemble together again and uh, be in the place of God's presence. Uh, that brought forth a celebration. It brought forth a expression of the joy Oh, being overwhelmed that now we are in the presence of God, collectively gathered together, assembled as one in observation, recognition, honor, and praise unto the God who brought us through that unex uh, unexpected or that experience that we had not encountered before. And now we give praise unto the God for keeping us, for preserving us, for, for uh, guiding us, uh, for protecting us and bringing us together again as a body uh, of believers surrendering our will to the will of God. Now the first section of our study is entitled Jubilation for Future Deliverance. Now, <clears throat> another point to um, somewhat to uh, discuss or to uh, try and picture and, and develop their perspective uh, about our lesson is is that when it says uh, future deliverance, uh, the instructions from our lesson here 
are not about the immediacy of deliverance, but the joy in the future deliverance. And Zephaniah is passing on to the people of Israel, passing on to them the promises of the fulfillment of God's word and of God's covenant promise with Abraham. And so our first section, when it starts off, it talks about, it says, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, and be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Now, it mentions uh, three different categories here. It talks about the daughter of Zion. And Zion, as we stated earlier, uh, sometimes was symbolically exchanged for the city of David and sometimes referred to as Mount Zion because it was the temple that was lifted in high region area in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was also the location of where the city of David was, and and also Jerusalem represented that back prior to it, when it was stated as Jerusalem, it was called Salem. And this is where Abraham met the priest, Melchizedek, Melchizedek, and offered the tithing, the first tithing that uh, was offered uh, when uh, Abraham instituted this practice of giving a tenth back unto the Lord. And so uh, when we see where this took place, it was in Salem, which later we refer to as Jerusalem. And of course, Israel identified as the group, the people, the nation of people that God is speaking to. And then it tells us that the judgments have been taken away and that God had cast out their enemies and that now the Lord was in the midst of them and they should not see evil anymore. Now, when we say that this is prior to their deliverance, we're looking at uh, when Zephaniah was among the people, they had gone from an exchange in exile from the Assyrian uh, Empire, and now uh, they were being consumed by the Babylonians. And so, uh, but this to some degree gave Judah some measure of independence. And so when we uh, look at the transference here, Zephaniah is uh, telling them that the day of the Lord is coming, that the day of the Lord is at hand. Now, uh, when we think of this, this is about six, seven hundred years prior to the birth of Christ. And uh, there are two applications to the day of the Lord. There is the physical presence of Christ, which was being prophesied uh, by the old prophets, speaking of the coming of the Messiah and the coming of Christ. And then there is also the futuristic uh, proclamation here, speaking of the spiritual, the spiritual kingdom of God. And so when we look at this, this is forewarning of that the day of the Lord is coming, the Messiah that we have prophesied of is coming. And so this is telling Israel that you should rejoice because your enemies are going to be removed, that the judgments are going to be removed. Now, in the introduction of our lesson, 
we learned that they were speaking of the social and moral uh, situation or condition at the time of Zephaniah. And, of course, uh, immorality was the order of the day. And so there were a lot of uh, things that were taking place, and many of the times uh, when we speak of the uh, incorrect behavior and practices of God's people, uh, the things we don't have to have someone to interpret and identify the ills, uh, we pretty much know what the indecent behaviors are. There is lying, there is mistruth, there is misinformation, there is immorality, there are there is cruelty, there is infidelity. So these are just the standards or normal practices among a people when God's judgment visits upon them. And the lesson speaks about judgment, and the commentary talks about punishment. But in the King James, it speaks of judgments, but in the NIV, it talks about punishment. And I'd like to make a distinction between the two here. Uh, one being is that judgments identify ills, incorrect behavior, it identifies wrong living, it identifies the corruption that is present. And many times when you identify what is wrong, the punishment or the consequences thereof, they come with the judgment. And so a lot of times scripture or a lot of times uh, commentaries attribute punishment to God. But the punishment or the consequences of mankind's own behaviors. And once my ills and once my corrupt behavior has been identified and the results thereof, well, then everyone's eyes are opened to what takes place when these types of attitudes and behaviors are practiced. And so when we look at uh, what occurs when we speak of God's judgments, I would like to bring attention to the 19th number of Psalm. Psalm number 19, and uh, I would like to begin the reading uh, at the ninth verse, uh, where it says, The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now, when we speak of the fear of the Lord. It is not the same or it is not synonymous with being afraid of the Lord. Uh, the difference here is fear of the Lord is referred to as reverential trust, reverencing the Lord, reverencing the Lord. So it is reverential trust and in that process of referencing or reverencing the Lord, it is also the hatred of evil. That's right. I said hatred of evil. So when we look at what is referred to when we speak of the judgments or the law of the Lord, the judgments are the truth and righteousness that is exposed. The truth and righteousness prevails and it gives, it uncovers the indecencies of mankind. And so once that is lifted and brought to light in our eyes, then the darkness is removed 
and the light replaces the darkness. Now, we sometimes, even in our physical domain, as parents and uh, as also uh, places or positions of authority, it is our place that when we see things that are wrong, it is our place to identify those things and then to explain the error. And that is the judgment. The judgment is to speak truth to the wrong and then to inform the right behavior. And so as parents and as people in position of authority who have been compelled by that uh, responsibility and accountability to speak truth in the presence of wrong and to identify that which is correct and right. And even by doing that, then wrong is exposed. And then those of sound mind are able now to make the correct judgments, to make the correct decisions, and to expound upon those things and live accordingly. And so, therefore, in the 19th number of Psalm, after the ninth verse, it says that the judgments which are the truth and righteousness of God, that they are more to be desired than gold. And so I wanted to just cite and to lift that in our first section. In the, in the end of our first section, uh, in the 15th uh, verse, where it talks about that the Lord is in the midst of thee, and we shall not see evil anymore. Um, when, when we are blessed with the insights of righteousness, then we know that the Spirit of God is present and among us. Because prior to that intervention, we have not seen truth or righteousness expounded in our midst. The lesson opens up talking about the damnation of the prince, the priest, and the prophets. And so when righteousness is lifted, it automatically makes a contrast between what we have been hearing and what we are now hearing. And then we know that this is the utterance of the Spirit of God because those that were speaking prior to the advent of the presence of the Spirit of God, they were not saying the same things. And uh, many times, those who work are the workers of iniquity. They don't self-convict themselves. They don't self-indict uh, uh, themselves. And so uh, we know now that the Spirit of God is present among us. And the other thing, speaking in relationship to the day of the Lord, is, is uh, again, Zephaniah speaking in advent of the birth of Christ. And we know that when we were told in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John about the coming of the Savior, the Messiah, uh, they said, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God is among us or God is with us. That leads us right into our second section, which says the promise of God's presence. Now, we just highlighted uh, how we know that God is present among us. But listen to what verse 16 and 17 say. Uh, verse 16 says, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, 
fear thou not. And to Zion, let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee, is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Here it speaks about the actual presence, how we will experience a new atmosphere, a, a new uh, spirit of dwelling. We will know it because when God, and God has never, there's never, I want to uh, cite this as well, because there's never been a time when God is not present. Because we know that God is omnipresent, is God is everywhere at the same time, at all times. But sometimes we allow evil and we allow persons and personalities to take preeminence over the presence of God. And then we ourselves become blinded by that which is ungodly and does not allow us to see that which is godly. But once we have become consumed by the sake of ourselves and then recognize what happens when we fulfill the desires of ourselves instead of the desire of God, then our eyes are receptive and our ears are receptive to see God. And so verse 16 and 17 tells us about the promise of God's presence. And I wanted uh, to just read this part, just the beginning of it, uh, in the commentary. And it says, The jubilation for future deliverance will be magnified because of the presence of God among his people. And there will be no reason to be intimidated, not to grow slack in their work for him. Their demonstration or the demoralization because of their present condition will be removed and they will be strengthened because of God's presence among them. Now, the scripture talked about not to be slack in their hands. And this is sometimes when we are toiling and we are working in unjust conditions. Uh, many times uh, we question whether or not our work is in vain. And is it being registered uh, on high? Uh, is our work going towards the advancement of us spiritually? Um, is, it, is it being demonstrated that this is uh, going to reap the rewards of our sowing. Will we reap what we have sown? And sometimes evil can be so prevalent until it makes us wonder about our work. It makes us wonder about our toiling. Uh, is this going to be accredited towards something? And so God tells through the prophet Zephaniah to let the people know this is not the time to slack and to diminish our work or decrease it, but this is the time to increase it. And so sometimes uh, we look upon, is my work in vain? And uh, I believe the, it was the Clark sisters uh, that put out a song about, is my living in vain? And it spoke about different practices of the faith. Is my singing, is my tithing, is my praying in vain? And said, no, of course not. For up the road, 
further down the journey is eternal gain. And that brings us in to the last section of our lesson, the promised transformation. And here, as we just finished talking about the uh, work of our hands, and it says, and, and there in, in the last portion of our lesson, the promised transformation, this could just this could have been a lesson all by itself. Uh, it talks about the I wills. This is transforming us from the acts of our own desires and bringing us into the promised transformation of God. And it speaks and it says, the I wills, I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly. Who are of thee to whom reproach of it was a burden? Now, our solemn assembly, uh, in the NIV, it was referenced as appointed festivals. But it was talking about our gathering, our coming together. And it spoke about how that there were some that were sorrowful in this assembly. And it spoke about how that God was aware of it, but God said that I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, who are of thee, to whom rebuke of it was a burden. And when we, or, I'm sorry, not rebuke, reproach, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. I was speaking of uh, the reproach and, and alluding into the definition or application of it, but it was speaking of when we were talking about the reproach of it was a burden, uh, this assembly, the gathering. It, it, it was speaking of how this was discredited, or this was some some viewed it as a disgrace. Uh, it was a disapproval, and it was because of how the gathering was taking place. Um, it spoke of how uh, the commentary made this uh, contrast of it, and it spoke of you never miss the water until the well runs dry. And, and it spoke of, of how that uh, sometimes we uh, become overwhelmed by the ritualistic practice. Not full worship, not spiritual intervention, but the ritualistic practice of the order of things. Sometimes... This is definitely not to be connected with generalizing the phrase. But sometimes we can call, find ourselves so duped into traditional worship until it loses its purpose. And we find ourselves so attached to certain practices until worship becomes portrayed as a script that is written. And you almost can participate and enact as a playwright, and you can predict or you can announce what's coming next. And sometimes, and as it was in the case here, those that were sorrowful, they were painting, they were poor in spirit because the practices of Israel had just become programmed ritualistic occurrences in the worship experience. And so uh, there were those that... Uh, were not, uh, they were not 
filled. Uh, they were not restored. They were not renewed. But they were the recipients of ritualistic practices. And uh, so, but here, through the prophet Zephaniah, God says that I'm going to gather them. And then, by the gathering of this, he said, to whom the reproach, to whom it had become disgraceful, to whom it was a disapproval, to whom it had become a burden, that God was going to lift that. God was going to restore that. God was going to transform that. And then another I will says that I will undo all that afflict thee. And I will save her that halted and gather her that was driven out. And I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. So when we look at the I wills here, we should focus on the things that God said that God would do. Not the consul, not the association, not the assembly, not the government, but God said that I will do these things. And when we see these things transformed, when we see that there is an intervention of those that have been taken advantage of, that have been afflicted, that have been oppressed. And when we see the oppression of those that are less fortunate, not that they are any less people, not that they are any less humane, not that they are any less of a person, but they have been afflicted by the will of others who have taken advantage of them. When we see that this has been lifted, when we see that they are now respected as individuals, as people, as one people, as all people, when we see that the attachments that have been assigned to them have now been removed and now their worth and now their ability and now their spirituality has been recognized and they have been placed in a position of praise and honor. Then we see the intervention of the Spirit of God in the midst of the people. And we could go on, but uh, we pray that you will look into the furtherance and the utterance of our lesson. We hope that during the course of this uh, presentation that, and our indulgence into this lesson that something has been said uh, to provide insights into what God wanted us to learn and receive in this lesson. And then, as always, most importantly, we hope that we will not just be hearers alone, but doers of the Word of God. God bless you, and God keep you.